Welcome to the Criminologist Podcast. Our goal here is to educate and enlighten our listeners, focusing on the latest and greatest evidence-based interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency, and not only those factors which drive folks into crime, we also look at the reasons why people exit a life of crime. Also, we attempt to paint an accurate picture of that journey from the perspective of the justice-involved individual. Too often, our perceptions of those involved in the system are tainted by media-driven caricatures created to sell newspapers or movie tickets. This adds little to a healthy dialogue as to how to best address criminality. This podcast will avoid stereotypes and biases. We will endeavor to accomplish the first two goals in a way that keep you, the listener, interested and even entertained. And now, the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. In this episode, I want to take the opportunity to follow up on last week's show in which we modeled Spot the Dog with the help of our client, Patrick Bateman. Um, Last week, I really wanted to make sure not to rush through that model of Dr. Bergone's Spot the Dog exercise, which they utilize in their sticks practice model. But that meant that due to time consideration, um, the modeling would take up most of our time for last week's show. And so today... I'm going to kick off at least by giving those themes their due diligence and tease them out a bit more for the listener. So if you have not listened to last week's episode, probably best to stop now on this episode and go back and have a listen to that one first. You don't want to watch Godfather 2 before Godfather 1. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. So to recap what we learned last week, again, thanks to... Uh, client Patrick Bateman and the Spot the Dog exercise, which we modeled. Um, The following themes here. Our thoughts direct our behavior. Treats or cookies teach. Spankings or kicks to the rear end confuse. I don't control outside cues, and outside cues don't control me. I do control my inside cues. And inside cues are my responsibility. And finally, I control my behavior. My behavior is my responsibility. So let's take a look at those themes one by one, beginning with our thoughts direct our behavior. Now, we saw this illustrated through our Spot the Dog exercise in last week's show, reviewing that with um, our client of how Spot learned how to sit, what that process looked like. When Spot finally learned to sit on his own, it was when he made the connection that placing his butt on the floor would result in him getting a treat or a dog biscuit or some some type of praise. Let's apply this to other situations to give this some context, since this is really at the crux of all cognitive behavioral interventions. And maybe as I go through this one, You can try to relate to situations in your life since that, of course, will work and maybe make it a little bit more applicable, help land on you a little bit better. Um, When I was prepping this, I contemplated illustrating this more via a client example, Um, but I opted not to do that because these concepts are universal. Um, That is, these just don't apply to criminality. So I could just use myself to highlight some of these concepts. Um, As I record this, I have a beverage in front of me. And if we reverse engineer how this glass of apple cider ended up on on my desk here, we would see that it could be traced back to my thoughts. Specifically, my thoughts that I want to have something to drink while I record. Um, Don't want to get a dry throat. Always want to... Um, be able to wet my whistle. It's fall weather out. It's rather crisp in the air. Um, really good apple cider season. Uh, all of those thoughts led to my behavior of opening up the refrigerator and pouring myself a glass of apple cider. If I never had those thoughts in my head, this glass of apple cider would not be sitting before me now. 
take a moment to reflect on all the decisions you've made just within the last hour. And if you try real hard, you can trace them all back to preceding thoughts that you had. On the one hand, you know, this is pretty self-evident if you reflect on it for a moment. But on the other hand, not so obvious to some. Okay, next we learn that um, treats or cookies or dog biscuits, what have you, they teach. Um, I should note that um, Guy Bergone and his colleagues who created Spot are Canadian. So um, as Guy taught this to me um, and as the printed materials reflect, um, they give dogs cookies in Canada. Here in the U.S., at least in my house, we give our dogs treats, dog treats. Um, and again, treats are really anything we like, okay? Um, and as we learn, the source of cookies or treats or biscuits can be inside or outside. Let's talk about inside treats first. These are things that we give ourselves, things like self-praise, um, the attaboys that we give ourselves, feelings of accomplishment, feeling proud, things of that nature. Um, what about outside treats? This is things like money, compliments that we receive from others, smiles we get from people, um, like I said, accolades, things of that nature. Most importantly, though, we learn that inside treats and outside treats teach. That is, after all, how Spot learned to sit, right? Um, I want to come back to this concept of cost and rewards in a second, but let's quick review our next takeaway, which was, um, you know, spankings or um, kicks to the rear end, um, spanking the dog, Um those confuse, and we learn the source of these scoldings or spankings can be inside or outside. Um, inside um, sanctions, if you will, that we give ourselves are, I'm no good, feelings of shame or guilt or regret, all that kind of stuff. Um, outside um, scoldings, if you will, are, Someone saying something to hurt your feelings or being neglected. Um, for justice-involved individuals, jail, of course, um, sanctions, just, again, those sort of traditional external punishments. Okay, now we learn that um, we give Spot a swat to his rear end when he sits. You know, that's just going to confuse the crap out of him, right? He's expecting a treat for sitting, and he gets, again, a, sp a spanking. Last episode, um, I gave a couple illustrations to our client, Patrick, about how um, inside cost and rewards, if you will, are the most important because they happen first. Recall I um, explained to Patrick or I, I illustrated through the story of um, if we um, used our imaginations and pretended that, you know, for example, if Patrick is sitting down to get high and soon as he um, takes a you know a puff of illicit narcotics if he's rather than feeling the high if he is magically transported to jail where he sits for six months um, with no feelings of euphoria from the drugs but then after six months when he's released if then the high kicks in if the sequence happened that way um, that would really deter him from using that drug again. Um, and again, it's because it, the concept here was the, the, the cost and rewards we get first are the most effective. And usually those are the cost and rewards that we give ourselves, right? We're, we're either praising ourselves or beating us up for decisions that we make before external forces do that, before other people do that. Um, that really is what drives our behavior. Um, we talk a ton on this show about the risk need responsivity model. Um, and you know, the risk needs responsivity model is derived from the psychology of criminal contact, um, which is the origin of general personality and cognitive social learning theory by James Bonta and Don Andrews. Uh, and in a nutshell, they're saying all behavior is learned behavior, including criminal behavior. And it's all predicated on the perceived or signal cost and rewards 
of a contemplated behavior. And so in last week's episode, we had a visit from our client, Patrick Bateman. Um, if you recall, we looked at his offense description. He's on for assault. He basically um, broke a beer bottle over a bouncer's head when he was told he couldn't leave the bar with a beer bottle. Um, so now if we look at those, those um, if we tally up, rather, those cost and rewards, or, you know, those treats and scoldings, if you will, inside and outside of his contemplated behavior to spat, to smash a beer bottle over the bouncer's head, you know, what would that look like? Um, his inside treats, he's giving himself things like, well, this is going to feel great to put this clown in his place, right? Patrick, we know. Patrick gets off on violence. This gives him a rush. Those are all inside treats. Um, outside treats, I don't know if necessarily his buddies were there to cheer him on, but, you know, again, those external or interpersonal um, stimuli, that would be an example of outside treats. Um, inside consequences, well, for Patrick, he had no regrets, no remorse. Um and we know the outside consequences. You know, he might get arrested. He might get convicted, sentenced, placed on probation, supervision. But again, the 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 treats and the and the costs that come first are the ones that are really driving Patrick's behavior. And in this case, it's the immediate gratification that he's going to get back at this bouncer who's trying to tell him that he can't leave the bar with a beer. So that's his inside treats he's giving himself. Forget about. The potential outside consequences or scoldings, again, I'm using um, the language from our spot the dog exercise here, but, you know, the possible, and I emphasize the word possible, possible arrest, conviction, sentencing, probation, supervision, those are down the road. So that's not really what's driving Patrick's immediate behavior. Um, again, it's the ones that come first really drive our behavior. Um, now, again, last week we talked about some takeaways I don't control outside cues, and outside cues don't control me. In this case, um, for Patrick, in his offense, the outside cue was the bouncer telling him he couldn't leave the bar with his bottle of beer. Now, to you or I, that would have been the same outside cue, right? You know, we all experience the world, the, the, you know, we see the world's the same. Um, but again, you and I have different thinking around being told that, we can't leave the bar with a bottle of beer than Patrick did. You know, maybe we go back inside to finish our drink. Maybe we pour it out or hand it to the bouncer to dispose of. Our balance of cost and rewards in that situation are different from that of Patrick's. Um, unless you are wondering what we do with our justice-involved clients in these situations, you know, once they're placed on supervision, is use cognitive behavioral interventions to get them First, to examine their thoughts and behaviors in this way, and then to start making that link um, between their thinking and their behavior. Um, we start working on tipping that balance of cost and rewards or, you know, treats and scoldings, if you will. Um, we use cognitive restructuring techniques to replace their riskier thoughts, which lead to poor outcomes, criminal behavior. Um, with less risky thoughts. And we, of course, we're going to cover these techniques in upcoming episodes here. But again, just in case you're saying to yourself, yeah, I get it. I get the thought behavior link, but how do we change that? Those are some things we can tease out in future episodes. Again, we change that, among other ways, through cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, and then this is really the final two themes here from last week where really um, recall, I don't recall, I don't, control my inside cues and inside cues are my responsibilities. And then I control my behavior. My behavior is my responsibility. Um, again, we don't control the outside stuff. We all um, experienced the same outside cues or external stimuli, but it's how we think and feel about these, um, which really drives our behavior. The good news is we control how we think and feel about these things. So therefore, we can control our behavior. If you would like more information on Spot the Dog or Sticks training, um, you can reach out to me and I can act as a liaison for Dr. Bergone and his team. Um, but yeah, I wanted to recap that again. Last week, we wrapped up with Patrick and, and because of time considerations, concluded the show, but I wanted to... Um, present some of those themes and give them their due diligence. 
So when we come back, let's take a look, a case study, a desistance case study, uh, with a real life desister, actor Danny Trejo. Stay tuned. A quick break from the show to give a shout out to our friends at APHIS, the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies. APHIS is a professional organization dedicated to uniting the forensic communities of criminal justice, education, law, medicine, and psychology. APHIS is a leader in building relationships within the forensic community locally and nationally. The mission of the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies is to provide quality education, training, consultation, and research in the forensic studies to professionals and students. AFIS is a leader in connecting members with one another to help facilitate professional growth, increased competency, and awareness in forensic mental health studies. For details as to upcoming training events, webinars, or publications, please visit them at www.aiafs.com. And now, back to the show. Okay, now I want to switch gears a bit here and move into the world of desistance from crime. As we have talked about, a lot of what we do in corrections and criminologies is examining those pathways into deviance. And as we address those reasons, we, of course, can extinguish that deviancy. Those in the desistance camp, however, look at those pathways out of deviance or criminality and try to augment or promote those pathways. Um, As I mentioned, if you have not yet, please check out the Criminologist channel on YouTube. I have a whole series on the topic of desistance from crime, and I want to touch on some of those themes here the remainder of this episode. Um, Again, we really highlight the risk need responsivity model on this show, which is really all about accurately assessing and addressing those, those pathways into delinquency, also known as criminogenic needs or criminogenic variables. Um, But again, that's really not at odds with the emerging desistance approach. Rather, these two models are on a continuum. It's um, kind of a ketchup mustard type thing. Um, Not so much Coke, Pepsi. You know, like I said, they're not in competition. And so really, to illustrate this point, um, I like to use the analogies of pathways. It's kind of an easy visual or concept for folks to wrap their minds around. Uh, Again, correctional approaches involve taking a look at those pathways our clients take into crime, into the crime force, if you will. And then when we extinguish those variables, things like substance abuse, negative peers, uh, risky thinking patterns, um, we do in fact see an impact on their behavior, some really decent effect sizes, if you will. And that really has been the model um, since Jim Bonta and Don Andrews and Stephen Warmoth and company um, sort of got the what works and evidence-based practice movement going in corrections in the late 1980s. Uh, as I said, though, those pathways into crime are not the same as those pathways out of crime. Desistance is not merely the absence of risk factors. I want to repeat that because it's worth repeating. Desistance is not merely the absence of risk factors. It's not simply a matter of retracing our steps or our pathways, if you will, into crime and, you know, pretending we we never walked there or that our clients never walked there. Um, So, again, if you stick with the analogy of pathways, along those pathways into crime, we see what are commonly known as criminogenic variables, Um, things like a lack of positive, structured, leisure, recreational activities, uh, perhaps strife in family and marital relationships, poor performance when it comes to school or work, um, substance misuse, and of course, the stronger correlates to crime, which are a delinquent past, also known as criminal history, negative peers, um, criminal thinking, and antisocial pattern of behavior. Now, We could simply have our clients, again, retrace their steps and eliminate all those things, 
leading into crime, but then that begs the question, what are we replacing those factors with along the way? Desistance um, isn't about going back. It's about moving forward. Desistance advocates believe that we shouldn't ask our clients to view their lives pathways as a wasted journey, um, rather to view it as a building block towards their, their, their fate or their destiny to their future self, their future crime free self. Um, so what is on this desistance pathway out of crime? You may be asking, well, let's take a look. On the off-ramps out of crime, we see vari variables which build up and augment factors underlying human capital, one's life resume, if you will, um, and also the building up of social capital. Social capital is not simply about replacing negative peers with positive peers. Social capital is about surrounding oneself with folks who provide us with opportunities, um, specifically opportunities which will act as off-ramps out of crime um, pathways, if you will. Um, desistance also, involve, also involves rather the rewriting of scripts from a condemnation script, you know, I'm no good, um, this is my lot in life, to a redemption script. Again, not about going back, but rather moving forward, knowing that Everything in our lives has led us to the person we are today. Desistance is about changing the crime trajectory out of crime. And we can do that by highlighting as many pathways out as we can for our clients, not simply rehashing those pathways in. Again, the risk needs responsivity model and desistance are not in competition. There are two points on a continuum. So you may be asking, what can you, the practitioner, do to help your client find those pathways out of crime? You can build up their human capital through education and employment and other such assets. Again, human capital is, is really your, your life's skills and traits. Um, encourage clients to augment their social capital by surrounding themselves with folks who will provide them with positive opportunities. And of course, never forget the importance of identity transformation. Help your client explore and begin reflecting on their future crime-free self. That, that self-conceptualization can go a long way towards augmenting desistance. Um, so now um, that I've sort of given a recap on desistance, let's take a look at a case study, again, that of actor Danny Trejo. Now in our YouTube video series, we have talked about primary, secondary, and tertiary desistance. Um, primary desistance can be thought of as behavioral, a uh, person moving away from crime. For example, when an individual is no longer offending, um, likely as measured via recidivism, this can be thought of as attaining primary desistance. Secondary desistance involves the all-important identity transformation. And on this stage of their journey, one's past is no longer a part of their identity. They no longer see themselves as a hustler or a shot caller, a pimp or a player or a gangster. Rather, they view themselves as a father, a good neighbor, a reliable employee, or a loyal friend. And finally, we have tertiary desistance. Tertiary desistance is all about feeling a sense of belonging within a community or personal network. Now, if you think about it, an individual could hit a plateau with either primary or secondary desistance before attaining tertiary desistance status. Just take a moment to reflect, particularly if you work with justice-involved individuals, um, as to clients that you've had who have stopped offending but they still have that old gangster mentality. They still root for the bad guys in the movies, and they see themselves as their old criminal self. Essentially, they said to themselves at one point, I'm getting too old for this shit, but growing sick and tired of spending Christmas in jail does not equate to secondary desistance. Not if they still maintain that old criminal self-identity. Now, could someone attain secondary desistance yet not reach tertiary desistance? 
Well, sure. Unfortunately, there are justice-evolved individuals who have long since stopped offending, and they no longer view themselves as, you know, within that old criminal identity. But due to bias and prejudice and other societal factors, they struggle attaining that sense of belonging within a community or even a pro-social network. Okay, so let's take a look at somebody who has made it to primary, secondary, and even tertiary desistance, um, and that is actor Danny Trejo. Many of you undoubtedly know the work of actor Danny Trejo from his numerous film roles. Um, he's appeared in such movies as Machete, From Dusk Till Dawn, uh, one of my favorites, Heat, alongside Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, and of course, Con Air. Um, Many of you likely did not know that Danny Trejo is, in fact, a formerly justice-involved individual, having done numerous stints in a variety of California jails and prisons. Uh, he was a, a gang member. Um, he struggled with heroin addiction for years and really lived the criminal lifestyle uh, in California uh, growing up. Um, while serving time in San Quentin prison, he became a Golden Gloves boxing champion in the California prison system. And also during this time, Trejo became a member of a 12-step program, which he credits with his success in overcoming his struggles with heroin addiction. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Trejo had attained primary desistance. He was no longer offending and was maintaining his sobriety. In fact, he was a drug counselor when, in 1985, he was contacted through a Narcotics Anonymous connection. Um, Trejo ended up on a film set to help somebody who was struggling with addiction. Now, Edward Bunker, a crime novelist and formerly justice-involved individual himself, he recognized Trejo from San Quentin Prison. Now, the screenplay of this particular film was based on one of Edward Bunker's novels. Bunker knew the director was looking for a boxing coach for actor Eric Roberts, and he remembered Trejo being a Golden Gloves champ in the California prison system. That movie was entitled Runaway Train. Um, Trejo was hired as a boxing coach and was earning $320 a day coaching actor Eric Roberts on boxing when the director took one look at all of his jailhouse tattoos and said, hey, do you want to be an extra on this film? And when Trejo found out it was a movie about a prison break, he figured he could handle that role. So suffice to say, he got bit by the acting bug, and to date he has appeared in over 300 movies. Now let's take a look at Danny Trejo's life through the lens of both primary, secondary, and tertiary desistance. Um, we talked about the fact that he attained primary desistance in the 80s when, or even 70s when he stopped offending and, and got sober. That was a behavioral change. Um, now how does Danny Trejo view himself? Let's take a look at secondary desistance. Trejo himself once said, quote, if you're going to be a criminal, be a criminal 24 hours a day. Now, do you think that's how Danny Trejo views himself now? A 24-7 criminal, convicted felon, inmate, um, heroin user, or rather, does he view himself as an actor, a restaurateur, a businessman, and even a father? And so, as to tertiary desistance, what does that acceptance within a community look like for Danny Trejo? Again, he is part of, among other things, the acting community. And as the owner of Trejo's Donuts, as well as other brands of beer, coffee, and merchandise, he's a, he's a member of the business community. And as I mentioned, he's the father of two, so he, he's a family man. So I think the case can really be made that not only has Danny attained primary desistance through his behavior, but he has attained secondary desistance through how he views himself and tertiary desistance, um, because he's been accepted in in several pro-social communities and pro-social networks. And hopefully that 
helps you all understand the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary desistance. I know as a desistance advocate, I, I bristle when I hear folks using the term recidivism and desistance interchangeably. That is simply not the case. Um, again, we can have justice involved individuals stop committing crimes. That does not mean they have fully desisted, hopefully as illustrated through this Danny Trejo case study. Okay, so in this episode, we recap some of the great themes we learned um, through Spot the Dog, which is, again, all about conveying to clients the thought behavior link. That's a cornerstone of one of the preeminent practice models in the risk needs responsivity world. And then we wrapped up taking a look at a desisted individual um, to look a little bit more closely on what that exiting from crime can look like for our clients. Um, to contact the show, you can reach out to us through the Paragon Group, LLC.com, or you can email me directly at the criminologist podcast at gmail.com if you have questions of me or you maybe have a question regarding the caseload that we supervise here on the show. And hopefully this episode intrigued you a bit more as to desistance and the desistance process. If so, I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. I have a whole series on the topic of desistance from crime. You'll also see other playlists there regarding implementation science, evidence-based practices in corrections, and a playlist around this podcast with some fun little behind-the-scenes things. Make sure, if you're not doing so yet, to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Criminologist Podcast. If you want to reach me here directly, you can email me at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow me personally, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn. We also have LinkedIn pages for the Criminologist Media Group and the Paragon Group. And as always, folks, remember, there's no them, there's only us. And, uh, you know, I got into making film by accident. I was a drug counselor. I was working with kids and I... And one night a kid called me up and said, hey, I'm having a lot of problems in 1985. And I, uh, I'd been out of prison a while, and I was his drug counselor, and I just went to hang out with him. And I happened to run into a friend of mine who were, we were actually in prison together, a guy named Eddie Bunker. And uh, he knew that I was lightweight and welterweight champion of every penitentiary I was in. And, uh, and he said, hey, we need somebody to train an actor how to box. And I just got to say, what's it pay? And he said, 320 a day. And I said, how bad you want this guy beat up, Holmes? You know, I... The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, training opportunities, or to contact the host, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. Click on the Contact Us tab in the upper right-hand side of the page. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening. The thoughts, statements, and opinions of the host and cast members do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers and are those of the host and cast themselves. Any discussion regarding client statements, behaviors, actions, or crimes are purely fictional and are used only for the purposes of example. Any examples that could be deemed to be related to an actual individual or individuals are incidental.